Aloha. I'm your host, Tim Apicella. It's Thursday, excuse me, it's Wednesday. It's July 22nd. It's 11 o'clock. It's Trump week. With me this week is Stephanie Dalton. Stephanie, aloha. Thank you for joining us. Uh -huh. uh, we will have Winston Welch and Cynthia Sinclair probably next Wednesday. So it's you and I for a long, fruitful discussion on the many, many things that have occurred since last week. Uh, again, you and I always talk about, and Winston talks about, um, when do get quiet? When do things become boring in the Trump administration? When do we not have something that we really have to search and dig for to talk about because it's just so boring? Those days never happen. That this never, it never occurs. So uh, this week is um, like the usual weeks, filled with things that you just go jaw dropping events here. Uh, I think the first thing we'd like to talk about is the interview with Chris Wallace. And uh, the title of the show is A Trump Alternate Fact. We have the lowest mortality rates. Well, a lot of people saw that interview with Chris Wallace and um, was surprised actually on how, how uh, detailed and how well prepared Chris Wallace was to actually take on Donald Trump with his usual, you know, um, uh, array of, of alternative facts and, and things that he expects Fox and other journalists just to gobble up and swallow as gospel fact and truth. But uh, Chris Wallace was having no part of it. What was your impression? First off, before we go in, into the detail, what was your impression of the of the interview? Oh, thanks for that question. I really admire Chris Wallace. I, but I didn't think he had prepared enough for yesterday. And that, that was validated uh, later when I think it was Lawrence, uh, last word Lawrence, um, O'Donnell pointed out that he didn't ask Chris about the, uh, Chris did not ask Trump substantive questions about like the, the bounty that, that Russia is offering the soldiers. So really that, point. I think that, did Chris Lawrence made a very good point there. He was looking, you know, across for the substantive and saw that Chris was getting a little bit, is that rope a dope? I don't I don't remember exactly what those wrestling uh analogies meant, but it was like Trump was able to control it more again because of the kinds of questions, the topics that yeah. Chris raised. I, I, not, I agree with that some of that because I did see Chris Wallace try to side up with Donald Trump buddy buddy up with him and try to prove the fact that he's a he's a hard-hitting journalist and took a great deal of time and, and effort to play uh some of the video clips of how he was interviewing nancy pelosi and other democrats and to show that he wasn't you know he wasn't a liberal journalist uh so he did that and um i also think that he um made a mistake by agreeing with donald trump when donald trump stated that when the election was won in 2016 Hillary Clinton uh, failed to acknowledge uh, his his victory, and, and Chris Wallace said, "I agree." Well, in fact, Hillary Clinton did call Donald Trump that night and wish him, you know, that he's the new president of the United States and, and congratulate him on that on that on that task. So there was a, there was a few flaws in in the interview, but given what most interviews look like on Fox News, um, I was still impressed with with what Chris Wallace did. Well, I, I was a little bit disappointed. I think that uh, Hillary called Donald very late. And so to give the little uh, click over to Donald, he might have been confused like it was the next day or something. But I think it was pretty late when she called. But I, I think that that Chris Wallace was defensive. And I, I was really surprised at that. He's very confident uh, and very... Uh, on track usually and well prepared and not susceptible to those kinds of uh, decoy uh, moves. And, 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 and the president was constantly making decoy moves and then even leading him into being defensive. I was, I, I'm really pretty surprised at that. But anyway, I, I thought that the, the data that he started out with, the data questions were not actually finished because what was it that Kaylee, the press person, mm -hmm. brought to Donald? So, so what survey was that? I mean, yeah, there was no follow up on, on that on that sheet of paper. So somewhere, and that, and that goes, yeah. 
that goes to yeah, the, yeah. you know the statement that Donald Trump made is that the United States has the one of the lowest mortality rates of COVID deaths in the world, and um, you know Chris um, Chris pointed out that no, Mr. President, um, we're somewhere around number seven, and uh, if you look at other ones, um, other countries, um, yes, we're better than others, but we're still ranking about number seven. And that's when uh, Trump asked his assistant to come out with uh, a sheet of paper that didn't have any data on it. It was just uh, a script. And there was no follow-up from uh, Chris Wallace on, on that, that data sheet. I felt that that was an unfinished question. And uh, for some reason, that, that happened early. And I don't know whether you know that in some ways uh, uh, caused a, you know, a distraction for Chris or what have you, but um, there were a number of, of places he could have gone and, and should have gone. Uh, one of the places to go, which I hear people trying to go and they don't finish it, and that is the, more, the only reason we have all these cases in the United States of America is because we test so much. Where is the coherent? I want a bumper sticker. <laughs> Come on. I mean, I've heard numerous people started in on it and it's so ludicrous that that is an issue. Uh, it's such a fallacy and I'm not about to throw out the statement that clears it up, but would somebody please clear that up? Why um, that is a false premise on the part of the president. Well, it's not logical. I mean, again, well, Donald Trump has the ability to take the non-logical, the, the, the idiotic statements and just repeat them enough times over and over and over again that we've, I don't know, it looks like most of America falls into a deep lull of um, zombieism and they just start nodding their head, okay. And that's not okay. Uh, there's no logical basis to say, the more you test is the problem. Well, How I about just the fact that the virus is in a lot more places and we just happen to be picking it up when we test. So I think that uh, this is another area, I guess the specifics on, on Chris's, uh, Chris Wallace's interview is that holding the president's feet to the fire. And so he, maybe that's a way of explaining what didn't happen, you know, because he didn't follow up on what was the, 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 the data report from that said we were so high or low or, you know, mm -hmm number one or not or the last on the list of deaths but he didn't hold his feet to the fire on what was that what does it mean and he's not getting an, him to stay on the topic enough where he's challenged to articulate what it means or anybody else that begins to talk about that it, it really because it's a disservice to us who are trying to understand it and not spend time thinking about this illogical idiotic statement. So um, not enough has been said about that. So I think there's work to do. There's work to do. I certainly expected Chris to do a lot more work than he did in that interview. Yeah. You know, he's really exhausted. Where, where there's the old Charlie Rose way of journalism, that is I'm spending my half hour on maybe one or two questions and we're going to do a deep dive on it versus mm -hmm. I think Chris Wallace had a whole sheets and sheets of questions that he wanted to get through in the time allotted during this interview. And I understand that too, because uh, unfortunately the attention span of the American public isn't geared to one or two questions for a 30 minute period of time or 45 minute period of time. So I think as well as like many journalists um, just has a, a machine gun, scatter gun approach on, on, on many of the questions that he wants to get answers to. I think one though, I, I did catch thought that I, I think went favorably for me as I listened to it was, if you remember, Donald Trump was asked a question back in March at one of the uh, COVID press press conferences is, do you, do you uh, President Trump take responsibility for where we're at with COVID? And he said, I take no responsibility. Well, during the interview with, uh, with Chris Wallace, Donald Trump said, look, I take responsibility always for everything because it's ultimately my job. Um, that's a contrast. <laughs> Because on Mar March 13, 2020, he took no responsibility, and I wish, I wish that uh, Chris Wallace would have pointed out that discrepancy. That, uh, well, now you do take responsibility, okay, and and you act like you've always taken responsibility for this, and that's not the case. 
That's a good point, Tim. Uh, a very good point, because that is a, a major criticism of the president. That always comes up in that how he has fallen short, you know, in his duty, in his due diligence. So that that's a really good point. Yeah, I think, you know, the work to do on this is unending. I, it, but and, and the list keeps growing of all of the things that need to be clarified, repeated, as much as the president repeats them to imprint us on his message the uh, other side needs to uh, repeat and uh, reiterate in order to understand how the, his tropes are, uh, are false and, and, and illogical and absolutely not needed, or they need, it, they need ex explanation. But anyhow, not to take, I mean, Chris Wallace was very, very good as usual. He just wasn't on the top of his game. And I think because he must have forgotten how hard it is to interview uh, Donald Trump. And especially now that he's so powerful and feeling it, that he did, he did override, overspeak, and interrupt Chris. So Chris was uh, hampered by not mm -hmm. having reference to, to complete his question or you know to have his comeback. I mean, there was even voice raising, well, and even bringing in the press person. As uh, as we talked about earlier, you know, I, he was he was dominating more dominant in the interview than Chris usually has to come. Yeah. Con I, I think Donald Trump actually, in my opinion, though, looked a little bit rattled during some of the um, the questions that Chris Wallace threw at him. And I think specifically the one that um, talked about the election results. And then ultimately the question was, are you going to accept the election results if you lose? And I think that question really threw Donald Trump a little bit back on his on his heels because he had to think about it. And ultimately, he said, "No, I may not necessarily accept the results. I didn't in 2016, and I may not necessarily accept them, you know, in, in the next 2020 election." Well, I think um, I want to reflect what I've heard another commentator say about that. Number one, who cares what he does who cares because there we do have that fixed so the founding fathers or the regulations or other statutes have that fixed and the answer is that it's not the u.s military that comes in and helicopters him out it's actually the secret service is there as soon as the election results are affirmed then their duty uh, shifts immediately to the new person. And they no longer are in the service of uh, Donald Trump, the president, and certainly never in the service of Donald Trump, his own self. So that is gonna be taken care of. Um, and, and we're wasting our time again on, on this diversionary material. Are, are we wasting our time? Remember in 2016, uh, about a month or two before the election, Donald Trump was going on and on about how it's being stacked, the, uh, the election's being stacked in the favor of Hillary Clinton. It's rigged. He used that term rigged a lot. And he actually um, really energized his loyal base into some kind of action and frothing that could indicate that they'd be out in the streets on election day if Donald Trump was not elected. Uh, he was elected, so that never took place. But I had fear in 2016 that What's he trying to do? Is he trying to incite uh, the more extreme population of his base? And is he doing that now? Well, I mean, they didn't even make it to the inauguration. So, I mean, <laughs> unless something's really, really changed. Well, that's a good point, <laughs> Stephanie. But are, are you at all concerned that Donald Trump sees seem to be sowing the seeds of... Um, dramatic protest. Now, I'm not saying violent protest, but um, is he sowing the seeds that this, this election didn't go his way, either through the mail-in ballot debacle that he thinks is a fraudulent process, or some other uh, shenanigans that, that cost him his election and his rightful term, second term, as President of the United States. And I, I get the sense that that's what he is hinting at, um, certainly when he says, I may not necessarily except the results of, of the election. Well, do you uh, agree with me that the actions, and I, I don't wanna jump ahead to topics, but I just think that scaring people like 
uh, those troopers are scaring people. And I don't mean to use derogatory terms or whoever those people are that have been sent in in the camo outfits without much in, insignia at all to help people understand who they are and where they're coming from and what their dilemma and what their own situation is in their hands. But don't you think um, that that's a scare tactic? Because if he's gonna do it for people running around with placards, then he could do it, uh, you know, but, but then again, well, how would he do that? Because he would no longer have the power if the election was duly uh, finalized. But so well, there I, is, but there I do- is a period between uh, November 3rd and January 20th. Uh, he, by constitutional statutes, he has to be out of that office January 20th at 11.59 a.m. Um, so let's, let's go back to what we're referring to. I call it the Great Portland Roundup, and that is uh, the sending in a, of federal police, uh, on a, not identified as what agency they belong to, certainly no identification of their names or last names, uh, certainly no identification of the vehicles in which they're, they're driving about in. Uh, those are from rental, car rental places. Uh, basically, these are federal, nondescript, mm -hmm. camouflage-clothed uh, uh, individuals that are roaming the streets of Portland and picking people up off the streets and taking them to un unknown locations. And that is intimidating, and I think that's the purpose of it. That is the whole purpose of it, and, and this does come from um, I, directly from Donald Trump. He, he threatened uh, the, the Seattle mayor and the Washington state governor that if they couldn't handle their thing in Capitol Hill, the, the chop, th that he would do something about it. And uh, he, he boasts and brags about the fact that chop was dismantled one day before he was going to send in federal police and uh, take care of matters. Now, I think what's dis disconcerting is that the the Oregon state governor and the Portland mayor have both said, get off our streets now. And they're refusing to do so. I think that's disconcerting. And, and terrifying. Uh, I mean, that is also maybe voter uh, oppression too, because when you get fearful, you don't want to have any association you know, with uh, follow up contacting you because you were somewhere you weren't supposed to be in their opinion. But anyway, no, I just uh, I think all of this going on from here is suspect. And uh, why do you uh, think it's why do you think he's doing it? Well, I just uh, heard somebody um, on NPR this morning say uh, he's going to tear down the house. He's, the, he's home alone. He's not got the polls going for him and he's gonna tear down the house as much as he can before he has to get out. So he will take it all down. And so to me, that made sense because I've been worried at some of these things going on. I mean, I don't understand why the current, uh, what, what, what's the difference between what was going on in those cities and the Occupy movement. I mean, in, in several cities, we had huge Occupy movements that went on for months and took over entire city parks. You mean and the, um, the Occupy Wall Street movement years ago? Yeah, yeah, was that yeah. years ago at this point? Yeah, I mean, and that, that was accepted as a rightful protest and they held out as long as they could and then came the winner. I, I just really kind of knew about it as the, on the East Coast, but, um, yeah, so anyway, I kept thinking, why is there any big uproar here with this when we've already had this you know, occur and we managed it? So, uh, and it went away, you know, as, as the president wishes the virus would go away. Well, this, this will go away, but with the stimulation of the camo unidentified uh, soldiers coming in or policemen or whatever they're supposed to be, it's uh, it's very concerning there, and they are stimulating the um, possibility for violence and and not enough training. And I do worry about that because we have all these movies that have explained very clearly to us uh, civilians who may not be trained that there are rules of engagement. I mean, this go and and certainly with the police too, they're supposed to have rules of engagement. But you hear more about not obeying the rules of engagement with the police, which is crazy in our country, than you do about the military scattered across the world that are guided by rules of engagement. I mean, you just- You know, that's a good point. That's a good point, Stephanie, because we don't know what exact agency they're all from. Now, some of them may have training in crowd control, 
but, but I suspect many of them don't. And if you watch their activity and their behavior as they're, you know, smacking people's wrists with a baton and breaking their wrist and, you know, putting mace in their face and, you know, people just standing there uh, as not doing anything in, in any violent way, uh, but they can't be identified because there's no identification tags and marks yeah. on their uniforms. It's just camouflage. Um, this is already happening. And, you know, I, I, I will remind you and the audience and everybody, um, when people aren't trained for crowd control, it doesn't take much for a, another Kent state to happen. Oh, absolutely. I think that's what is fearful, fearsome. And uh, the Naval Academy uh, graduate uh, with his T-shirt on was uh, uh, ju a ju made a judgment call that probably wasn't an A plus in uh, the mediation course. But the obviously those he uh, approached had no had absolutely no option for responding to him in any way but violently. There was nobody that acted like they were ready to talk or answer his question and then get you know on with it. Nothing. They had no 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 string in their violin for that. That's for sure. It was just purity attack. Right. So that that's a really good point. They they just are not uh, that that the training the lack of training is very apparent that they okay. Don't. So we're getting comments you know from from the attorney general of Oregon State, and I've heard her interviewed several times that there's no legal basis for them to come in without the permission of the governor and certainly the permission of the, the, the city of, of any mayor. Um, but one might argue that this is federal property and if it's not being um, protected, that maybe the feds do have some kind of overreaching authority. Um, what's to prevent the governor or the mayor to say, all right, you, you've sent them in, but their jurisdiction begins and ends with their front lawn and their backyard. The second you step off the front lawn or back lawn of that federal property, you're now in violation of our rules of authority and our rules of engagement. Excellent. So, um, yeah, excellent. And plus, there's usually a band, like a 10, 20 foot perimeter. There's a perimeter. I mean, these buildings are usually very large. Uh, I don't know what they are in Portland, but uh, they're usually very large. Certainly ours is out here in Honolulu, it's larger than any of the buildings in Washington, D.C. But that could be a solution to uh, establishing boundaries. There you go. Yeah. So what we saw in video, though, of course, is, as I refer to is the Great Portland Roundup is they're driving around in unmarked vehicles from a rental agency and they're driving on the streets of Portland, downtown Portland. Uh, yeah stopping and picking people up and throwing them in the van. So they certainly have breached their jurisdiction, if nothing else. Um, it'll be up to the courts to see if they've breached their authority to do these, um, to do this sort of thing. But they're way off their turf. And I think that needs to be reined in immediately. Certainly. That's, yeah. Yes. Well, we don't have too much time left, but I do want to talk about an issue. Um, Donald Trump has recently appointed back in June a Louis DeJoy, and this individual is now in charge of the United States Postal Service. And there seems to be a concern about this particular appointment, and that is to what degree um, does she act as an independent postal mas uh, general master for the post office and ensure that any mail-in ballot that is received uh, weeks or weeks away from the general election day or on election day will actually get to its point of destination and counted. Uh, there seems to be a great deal of discussion about that. I, well, I don't know if you've heard of it, but uh, what's, your, what's your kind of your thoughts about that? Well, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm sure, I, I'm not sure, but is he, he is most likely an acting leader. So as, as the president has not um, nominated or put in place at the real, the real, everybody at the agencies who's the top, person is acting, which takes away their statutory authority. And they're still then under the guidance of the um, cabinet and the, and the president, maybe just the president in the executive branch. So that is the case with the post office. So he's not making any independent decisions. He can do, he can make whatever recommendations he will submit to the president. This puts the president in the position of, of actually making the decision. So here we go. Mm -hmm. And of 
was, uh, the post office has been encumbered for decades now with unusual uh, regulations uh, to for use of their funding. I mean, they had to pay in contrast to every other agency um, and, and especially without respect to their mission, which is ongoing up mountaintops and through rain and 24 seven, um, they have to pay all of their pension, uh, um, you know, obligations. They had to fill up their, all their pension obligations for like 20, 30 years or something like that, which just sapped their budgets. And that that's, I don't know that that's changed. So right. that, one of the reasons they're in the peculiar situation they're in versus all the other agencies that are uh, not under that kind of, uh, of a, admin, a requirement. So it's gonna be easy to, to take them. It's not that it's easy. It's just that this, you know, the fox is outside the hen house. And- um, Well, no, I guess that's a good point, Stephanie. And I guess the question is how do we ensure that the hen house gets the, gets its mail and it gets to the election centers to be counted. And I don't have an answer for it. I, I have a potential solution. And that is as a voter, if you're worried that your mail-in ballot is somehow gonna be um, lifted and, and put in the, in, the, you know, in the back alleys of some, some other street and it won't, you know, won't reappear for a month or two, then maybe it behooves you as a voter to go to an election center and uh, hand deliver your, your ballot your mail-in ballot. I mean, uh, the, the commercials here in Hawaii certainly uh, alludes to that, that if, if you're concerned about mail-in ballots and you can drop it off into a number of election um, gathering depots and, and drop off your ballot there. It's not a bad solution. It's a little bit uh, inconvenient, but it's not a bad solution. But that's very good. Yay, Hawaii. Let's hope we're starting a trend here. I understand that the defense for uh, saving this, this attack on the post office is that the veterans all receive their monthly checks. That, but even more important is that the medications are going out through the good mail. Point. Yeah. Heavier bad uh, baskets or boxes than ever before. And it would put a lot of people actually at risk of death if they didn't get there. So, I mean, there are a lot of just their yep. Excellent point. A lot of red states, a lot of blue states would notice that if that occurred. That's a really great point. Okay, Stephanie, it's, we're almost at our t uh, at the end of our time. So, real quick, as I like to do, uh, you have any predictions for the next coming week? Well, I, I'm going with the burning the house down. The house down. <laughs> exactly. What can that mean more than it already does mean? So, I'm ready. All right, and you're uh, ready. Uh, you're ready for the, the, the calamity in Washington, D.C. and the potential hurricane coming from Hurricane Douglas heading our way. So it, it comes. That's right. Hopefully. Yeah. OK, Stephanie. Hey, thank you so much for joining us on Trump Week this Wednesday. I'm Tim Apicella. Please join us next Wednesday, 11 o'clock for Trump Week. Aloha.